Hello, everybody. It's uh, Friday night here in Virginia Beach. I'm uh, I'm out on the porch of the Sandcastle Hotel having a drink. Going to have a cigar uh, first for our Zoom meetings. I may just move them to Friday nights so I can brick. Well, and smoke, you know. So, um, welcome to all my brothers from Australia. So, who do we have so far? We got Graham, Linz, uh, Brendan. I know. I got to make up a list of everybody who's participating. Seven fifty-six. We wait for minutes. Get all this stuff ready here. Okay, so for my speakers, for my panel, uh, Graham, Brendan, I don't recall who all I invited. Uh, Lens, I know. Um, Robert Wrench, now you're from you're from uh, Virginia, aren't you? Yes, I'm Cherrydale, forty two. That's what I thought. Good to have you with us. Uh, let's see. Uh, Michael Mayer, where are you hail from? I am from um, Arlington Sentinel Glebe, uh, Lodge 81. Excellent. Okay. And Rick, Rick is and Tom. Tom Sheehan, are you one of my panelists? Um, no, Sorry. I'm just uh, okay. received the letter to join. That's me. fine. That's fine. Okay. So, so far I have Graham, Brendan, and Linz of the group. Sorry, I'm working off my laptop. Normally, I got my computer, and I got two screens, and I have more, more um, surface area to put things and be able to look at things. So I'm kind of making do with the little bit of screen here. So how you doing, Dave? Brandon, good to see you. I'm good. I'm good. All right. I, I see you still have your uh, nuclear fallout shelter as your background. That's good. Yep. yep. <laughs> Rushton, the Rushton Triangular Lodge. Yes. Oh. <laughs> All right. And Pete is here. Uh, uh, my lovely co-host, Brian Smith, cannot be here. He apparently has social activities beyond Mason, which is, you know, just beyond offensive. But we're going to let it go. Apparently, he has parties at his house. And uh, it's 1 a.m. in the U.K. right now. So I totally understand. He says the party is still would still be going strong at that point, and he's the host, so we can't leave. I guess having people in person is a little more important than attending a Zoom meeting, but we can always debate that. So he will not be joining us. Thankfully, Paul is filling in as my lovely co-host. I don't know. Who, who filled in when Ed McMahon wasn't there? I don't know. Anyway, my alternate Ed McMahon. <laughs> so good to see you all here. I'm uh, I'm in Virginia Beach. I'm actually at the beach. Uh, I'll go and show you all. Um, let's see where's my. Let's see if we can be on either the second zero here. Okay. There we are. Okay. So this is trying to look at the. There we go. Okay, so that's the 14th Street Pier at the ocean front. And here, there you go. You can't see it through the, the cloud of smoke, but that is something in the water down on um, down around First uh, Avenue down at the ocean, at the uh, far end of the ocean front at Rudy Inlet. And we're staying at the lovely Sandcastle Hotel. And I had to run out at 5.30, go home, feed the pig and the dog, and try and get back here by 8.00. So I somehow managed to do that. <laughs> so let me just get my camera straight. Sit back and do this. Um, I hope y'all can hear me over the surf and all that. Everybody hear me all right? Sure. Yep. Okay. Very good. Very good. Okay. So yeah, so we're doing things a little bit differently. Um, for everyone who hasn't figured it out, be able to be clear. Um, oh, Richard. Okay. I think Richard's on my list. Uh, for those who haven't figured it out, we are meeting on Friday night because this is a panel discussion with all of my dear brothers down under in Australia. 
and it's currently 8, 9, or 10 o'clock in the morning on Saturday for them. So I want to make it as easy as possible for our panelists to participate. And that means having it on Friday. So hopefully a couple of you brothers out there who complain about not being able to attend at 7 or 8 in the morning, whatever, wherever you are, um, because you meet on Saturday mornings, hopefully they will show up here. And we may we may change it from time to time. I don't. So if you bear with me, I'm going to get my cigar set up. None of this will go on the YouTube, so you all can say whatever you want right now. So um, let's see. Richard and from Australia. You're, a, you're one of my panelists, I presume? Richard Mum. Mm -hmm. Morning, Richard. Hi, Richard. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Um, Alan. Brother Alan is driving, I assume. Or are you? No, are you driving now, Alan? Were you actually they're at all? They're all on mute this morning. Yeah. Okay. Parked in you're parked. You're on the road, though. I mean, yes. Okay. Good to have you here. I'll have to look at the camera later and see how this all looks. But you were wondering how some of Northern Virginia brothers got into this. It was the invite was forwarded to me by Alvaro Tarico, who is a member of Arlington Centennial Glebe 81. So I yes. thought it sound interesting. Oh, I appreciate him forwarding it. I hope he joins us. I think he has to be, he was either on the mailing list or, no, someone else has to be on the mailing list that, that he forwarded to, I think. So I appreciate it. Uh, if he's here, point him out. <laughs> Thank you. But I appreciate all my Virginia brothers coming here. It's a funny thing. This is hosted by Virginia Research Lodge, of course, and I get very few Virginia Masons here. I get guys from all over the, the country. I don't have any lights out here, so I don't know how well it's going to look. Um, I may go to darkness soon. I don't know what's going to happen, so we'll see. I may just sit here in the dark and just see my cigar going. But it's nice to be outside. I, I tried a couple weeks ago at one of our meetings to set up outside and set up my laptop and um, make sure that you could see me on the camera so it would be clear. Well, I have to manage the board and the Zoom and, you know, the Word document, whatever else I got going on. And so I needed to see if I could see the board and you could see me. I could see me just fine at 9 o'clock in the morning, but it was so dang bright, I couldn't see the computer screen no matter what it did. So I couldn't do it if I had to sit in the dark. So I've not been able to have this outside yet because it's in the in the daytime. So this should be a lot of fun. I'm, I'm looking forward to this for a while. So this should be great. Uh, let's make sure I've got everything here set up. Here. Oh, I have an online event starting soon. Yeah, okay. All right. And I see Graham posted it in the in our Zoom. Okay. Yep. All right. So hopefully everybody will see here. We'll give everyone a few more minutes. We're right at, we're just after eight. Uh, Brother Rick, Brother Jonathan, good to have you. What's up, Pete? There's Pete. Hey, Pete Gordon, how you doing? Our lovely, gracious secretary from Virginia Research. Doing great. All right. Appreciate you coming out on a Friday night. By the way, we are drinking. Uh, uh, damn, what's the name of it? Wait, hold on. It is. I, sh I should start getting product placement. We are we are drinking. Um, oh, there it is. Um, Breckenridge Bourbon Whiskey from Colorado. It's actually quite good. I'm a, I'm a maker's mark kind of guy, but I found this and tried it. It's really good. So I'm enjoying my bourbon. I hope you all enjoy a libation where you are. Um, I would say uh, in Australia, y'all could enjoy some. Some Bloody Marys this morning, but whatever, whatever suits the movies about it, guys. So, okay, enough kidding around. Is that eight? Good evening and good morning to Australia. Um, my name is Chris Douglas. This is Virginia Research Lodge's um, Zoom meeting, our unstated meeting on April the 28th and 29th. Um, 
Today's topic is Brothers Down Under, where I'm going to be, um, I'm going to be talking with analyst from um, Australia. Let me open my word document. Sorry. 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 Uh, what was the chat? Yeah, let me open up the chat. Um, I don't know how I'm going to do this with my little laptop and read the Word doc, but I'm going to do my best. So bear with me as I figure out how I am doing all of this. Uh, everybody, okay. Yes, Jonathan, you're going to the one-day conferral. Good for you. And yes, please have a drink of your choice out there um there's a so, good starting question what's a one day referral oh yes a one day conferral is something well uh okay i'll be nice i think they're a terrible idea but they are having them in virginia about every three years the grandmaster if he wants has a one day conferral which means all of the lodges are expected to bring candidates our Benevolent Grandmaster has asked, he's trying to bring in, I think, 600 new Masons this year, and to do that, we're having one day a one-day conferral at several locations within the state. So you show up, about 100 guys show up, 50 or so candidates, however many you got, and you have all three degrees are conferred over the course of from like 8 in the morning to like 1 in the afternoon, one right after the other. All of the candidates are sitting on the sidelines. There's one um, representative for the whole class. And then they all have a uh, mentor sitting there with them with the Bible so they can take the altar and take the obligations at their seats. But it's a one day, zero to three, uh, get your master basins to bring one day thing. Um, so that's tomorrow. I'm not participating because I'm down here at the beach, but um, that's what we're doing. So we we can debate the merits of that another time. <laughs> we could. We could. <laughs> I actually plan to have a panel discussion here, uh, just sort of an open-ended thing and get people to join in and just talk about things in masonry uh, that are interesting. And it's been and I'm getting apps, getting apps. You're turning into an AI voice. What's that? You're turning into an AI voice. Am I? What? Yeah, oh, it's cleared up now. Oh, yeah, was I? Fine. Oh, okay. Yeah. It may be the Sorry. noise cancellation that's uh, kicking in. Was I? Wait, did that sound like a banjo? Did that sound like um, Stephen Hawking? Either. Yeah. Either. <laughs> yes. Either. Right. Okay. Now, let me know when I... <laughs> All right. Um, oh, and yeah, Kevin, first time live, dude, works good. Well, good to have you with us then, Kevin. From Kentucky. Very good. Okay. So I'm going to go over the list of panelists again before we get started. I have Graham, I have Brendan, I have Linz, and I have Richard. Is there anyone else here who is from Australia who's on our panel? Anyone? I had five. I had five at least confirmed. Okay. Well, we're going to go with the ones we have then. Okay. So uh welcome to all of our brothers um oh yeah my uh oh shoot i don't have my my things well uh i normally would put the links in the chat but since i'm on this computer i don't have my links um set up but uh, uh normally i would post a link to our facebook group and all like that but uh you can contact me afterwards if you want to get in our facebook group if you're not already let's do that okay with no further ado since we're 10 after um this is brothers down under and i'm just going to rotate through each one of you and then if you want to um to add a brief comment on the last speaker that's fine um but i do want to i prefer not to go at length and please don't jump ahead and answer other questions because i already have a bunch of questions lined up i'm hoping to get through all three pages of questions so please um 
Do not be overly lengthy in your responses, if you don't mind, because I want to cover a lot of ground. So, we'll start with Graham. And I uh, will start with the first question. Um, how many Grand Lodges are there in Australia? Uh, that's a good question. I believe there's six Grand Lodges in Australia. Okay. And they're not related, specific. It's kind of like America where every state is its own Grand Lodge. There's no Grand... Is there not Grand Australian kind of body that ties them together? No, there's no, there's no uh, national body. Um, okay. The the six grand lodges. Brendan might be better to answer this question, but I believe there's sure. six grand lodges uh, okay. relative to the relative states. And you're in which one? Uh, I'm a member of two grand lodges. Okay. Well, one's just New South Wales. Uh -huh. One's New South Wales and ACT. Okay. They're joined together. All right. Uh, Brendan, how many lodges in your Grand Lodge? Ooh, current estimate is 200 and I think around 20, 230. Okay. Do you think that's typical across the board or are they all work with the same number of lodges? Uh, no, it varies due to size of state and population. Oh. I mean, Victoria is the second most populous state in Australia. All the rest are a lot smaller in comparison. Okay. All right, then. Linz, um, how is the Grand Master selected for your Grand Lodge? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, <laughs> I think... Um, I, uh, Brendan can correct me uh, if I'm wrong because we're from the same jurisdiction, which is the United Grand Lodge Victoria. Uh, I think the Grand Master is uh, effectively chosen by a uh, panel of senior Freemasons uh, and will generally be the uh, the Deputy Grand Master the, the previous sitting period. Okay. Does that sound right, Brendan? Is, is he voted for at all or is he just chosen by a panel and say, here's the Grand Master? Uh, chosen by a panel, no vote really? by the members. And is that a, does he does it, how long does he serve? Two years. Two years, and do they ever do more than two years or two? Uh, we just had one, two, three because of COVID. Right, yeah, COVID. No, COVID breaks all. Okay, um, and Richard, who are the other? Uh, what are the other grand officers? Oh, grand, well, deputy grand and all like that. Yeah, there's a de deputy grand, an assistant grand master, and then grand wardens, and then the whole shebang all the way down. It's okay. Down to grand sweepant. And how are they so selected, they Richard? Oh, they're all appointed. They have appointment committees, and okay. uh, the grand master in South Australia Northern Territory is elected. Oh. And over the last four years, we had one year we had three candidates. Another year we had two, but that until about four years ago, I think there'd only been about two elections in a hundred and so hundred and twenty five years. Okay, all righty. And is it basically progressive though, Richard? Like they they advance uh, like junior, grand junior deacon well, the or somebody. The deputy the deputy will become the deputy is eligible to become the grand master, or anyone's eligible, mm -hmm. uh, but. Uh, Usually the deputy follows on, but not not invariably. Okay. Uh, yeah. All right. Well, as a comparison in Virginia, which I like to now I'll, I'll say this, and y'all might correct me, but generally I think Virginia is typical of the Preston Webb style American right, which is what it should be called, York right, which is what it really is, Grand Lodges of America, all the U.S. Grand Lodges. We're all very similar, and I think Virginia is typical. It's probably little minor changes. Um, we elect a grand master, we have a deputy, and we have a junior, grand junior deacon on up, and then secretary and treasurer for years, and of course, uh, like a lodge. But they all they each get elected for one year. The grand master nominates a grand junior deacon, the incoming one, and then there's typically not opposition. So it's like a six year line, but they each serve for one year. But they're all they've always been elected. But who actually gets to get? You know, since it is nominated by the Grand Master, it is a very select group. It's rare that a brother off the floor gets nominated for Grand Junior Deacon and actually wins against the Grand Master's choice. Uh, 
Brendan, are there districts within your Grand Lodge? How are your lodges organized? Um, now, the important thing to remember in all of this is we vary quite distinctly from state to state. So yes, if I say I something, as soon as of you course. cross over the border, it changes completely. Uh, right. Here in Victoria, we have 17 districts. Okay. Um, they, and about how many have, lodges? Uh, around 20 or so in each one. And that okay. will give you a figure of around 200 whatever yeah. lodges. Okay. Uh, and sorry, uh, Grandma. Go ahead. Would you have more of you? I was just going to say, in each one of those districts has an appointed district coordinator. Oh, okay. like our district deputy variants. Yeah. And uh, we, uh, we, we have the district deputies appointed by the Grand Master. He's actually nominated from the... Um, we not? Sorry, clicking around here. Questions are... Okay. Sorry. I'm moving things around so I can see your pictures and still uh, get my questions here. Uh, the district deputy is typically nominated from each. Um, each lodge gets a turn. So if there's six lodges in your... There's now nine in my district. They're usually around six is average. And each lodge gets a turn to nominate someone... Almost always, everybody else concurs on the Grandmaster, except the nomination. Sometimes, and there's been several recently in our area, uh, sometimes the Grandmaster says, nope, not him, someone else. And recently, uh, the guy was in for about two months. The Grandmaster said, nope, you're not doing a good job, and replaced him. That's the first I've seen of that. Um, let's see. Uh, um, oh, yeah, uh, Linz. Are you, and is it, I'm sorry, is it Linz that, how I say it, just Linz or? Yeah, it's yeah. Linz, or Lindsay is the, the proper name. Lindsay? Okay. Lindsay. All right. Yeah. Uh, how many, um, uh, oh, well, I guess, I don't think this really applies. I don't think you all have provincial grand master, because you're not like the grand, like England, where you are you can. So we're going to skip those questions. Okay. Are your lodges yeah. called blue lodges? Yeah, we, we uh, they are called blue lodges or craft lodges, and okay. uh, different appellations depending on the the um, the other orders that are that are worked. Oh. Okay, um, Richard, um, how is the worshipful master selected for the <laughs> Oh well, the worshipful master, it's it's a progressive office, but. Okay. Uh, we have an executive in my particular lodge that I'm the secretary of. We have a, one meeting a year where we it's like an annual general meeting. We discuss who the incoming officers are going to be, and sometimes uh, a warden may not progress because he hasn't performed very well. Oh, okay. Uh, but is he elected? Is there an election every year? Yeah, there's an election every year. Actually, I'm a member of an Irish lodge as well. In my wow. Irish lodge, every officer is elected. Uh, okay. Whereas uh, in the South Australian Lodge I'm a member of, it's the master, the treasurer, and the tiler. Ah, okay. All right. And, and, the, rest, the, rest, and the rest are sort of progressive or appointments. So you you can be appointed, say, to be in a guard, and then you might progress up. Okay, but then you have to actually be elected to be master. Yes, well, and the time treasurer. Time. And, and the treasurer and the time. Do, do you, well, are those part of the progressive line? Or are they separate? No, the uh, the treasurer and Tyler are not, but uh, all the others would be considered to be progressive, yes. Right, so like, if, if so like, guard, so what, like the senior warden is the, is the, the XO to the, grant, to the master, so he would be the one. You get appointed all the way up to senior warden, and then he gets elected master. That's correct. correct. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. yeah. And do you have your secretaries? Are they appointed then? No, the, well, the secretary is appointed, but <laughs> it's, it's hard to find someone to be appointed. <laughs> okay. Well, that's that's true anywhere. Okay, very good. All righty. Um, uh, Graham, what are the qualifications to be an officer or to be worshipful master? Like, the is there a worshipful master? Yeah. Uh, must have been a past warden, so that will be an, yep. uh, a junior warden or a senior warden in the lodge. Right. But like a warden certificate, like a ritual proficiency, anything like that? 
Um, we don't have a proficiency as such. You just need to be a a warden or a, 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 like a, a past <laughs> junior warden right. or senior warden. No, you're right. Interesting. Um, Brenda, do you have the past masters? And is it part of the master of lots? Ah, uh, yes, we do have past masters. We have an immediate past master who sits to the left of the master. No, no, the I, I don't mean, I mean uh, the, the past master's degree that you have to have to be masked, anything like that. Uh, no. No. Roger, Roger. Okay. Well, for Virginia... Uh, that um, originally came out so that you could... Um, Join other orders, wasn't it? If you hadn't been the master yeah. of a lodge, I yeah, the royal lodge. It's the royal different lodge. everywhere. Um, in Virginia, you must have the past master's degree in order to be elected. Before you can be elected junior warden, you must have received the past master's degree. Now, the past master's degree is part of the royal arch chapter. So, if you join the chapter, you get the past master's degree as one of the six degrees. If not, we do what we call a provisional lodge of past masters, and the Royal Arch chapter in your area will confer that. But you just basically get the degree, and you don't get seated in the chair and all like that. But um, it's very similar. And if you don't have a past master's degree, I, well, I'm not going to explain it, but you basically you, you can ask questions to see if you can be master. Um, but it's a requirement to be master, and you do have to have a warning certificate to be elected master. But we it's have very the kind of authority. Go ahead. Yeah, we have the we have the installed master's degree. Okay. So when you yes. when you're elected as the master, you're the master elect, and then the lodge will be called up to say the third degree, right? And then, you, well, you'll take your obligation in the second degree, and then you go up to the third degree, and then the board of installed masters is held, and then you go through the. But it's only the master elect that goes through that degree. Yeah. Okay. So it is. Basically the same thing, but it's the night of the installation, correct? Yes, correct. That, yeah, yep. okay, I've heard of that. So that means now, so only past masters or installed past masters can sit in that section when he gets his degree. Is that correct? Correct. Yes. Yep. So, you know, that, honestly, I think that would be more fun. It just would make the end. It was longer. And so you have the same requirement we do, but it's literally the night of his election. Because... Like I said, we can get it if you join the Royal Arch at any time, or if you you have to have that degree when you're before you can be elected junior to warden. So every senior deacon in your district, they go and ask them, you know, if they're planning to be junior warden, well, you need to go and get this degree sometime this year. So, but it is a requirement. So that's interesting. So it's very similar. Um, and in I, every some time, jurisdictions, we have a hollow square during that ceremony. The master oh, is exactly. given the secrets inside the hollow square. Okay. And that's formed by sitting masters forming the square. Very interesting. So it is quite soon. It's funny, the past master's degree, and I should probably do a paper on just the past master's degree, because honestly, every time I've asked one of my British brothers about the past master's degree, I get conflicting answers. Some say they don't have it, they've never had it, you don't know what you're talking about. Some say, like like Richard just said, yes, but it's called, maybe it's called something slightly different, and you have to get it the night of your installation. But not every lodge in England does it. So it's kind of like chasing my tail, like, well, well, it, it, do you have one or not? And I get different answers from people, so it's kind of funny. I always find that interesting. Okay, uh, let's see, that will, so... Um, and if I, if, if I, by the way, if I call you out of turn, don't feel bad. I'm trying to go in order here. Um, uh, Graham, in your lodge, how many members in your lodge is that typical? You know? uh, in my lodge, there's 230. Okay. And typically, typically, you'll get about 50 members turn up to a lodge meeting. Oh, you get that many show up? Oh, okay. No, I mean, like, just overall size or all. Uh, Lodges vary from like 100 to 300. I mean, is it kind of I'm, that? Be, any of them really big? Or I'm a member of a lodge in Western Australia, Scottish Constitution Lodge, and uh, they have about 100, about 100 members. Okay. Um, and in the New South Wales Lodge that I'm a member, they have 200. 
and 30 odd. Okay, not, not out of, I would say a few years back, I, most Virginia lodges are under 200. Now, my lodge is just under 200. We had like 300 some when I affiliated. Um, at one time, some of the lodges in my district had a thousand members, but that was like back in the 90s, and that's gone steadily down. But it's about typical. More lodges are down below 100, which surprised me because just a few years ago, if a lodge fell below 100, they were in danger of closing. Uh, but we seem to have several uh, that hover around 100. Um, uh, the majority of lodges in Victoria are under 100. Okay. So you're you're not that different from us in that case, Brendan. Um, what how what's the average age? You know, like for what would you say for your lodge or for like Grand Lodge? Do you have a rough idea? Uh, the average age demographic here in Victoria has dropped to about sixty-seven. Okay, so that's what you're doing. Okay, um, Linz, are is your lodge um, York right, Scottish right? Some other right. What 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 is what kind of right does your lodge practice, and is it different? Like, are there varieties within your grand lodge, or how does that work? Now we don't. Uh, I don't know that we actually practice the York right or the Scottish right in Victoria. It's just uh, just a uh, an ordinary craft lodge. I don't okay. know that we have. Uh, we, we have we have the Mark Master Mason degree and the chapter and the Holy Royal Arch and the, the Knights Templar and so on. But I'm, I'm not sure that As we call them the York. Scottish right. Okay. Well, that, that, and there are like a pen. Well, we we'll get to a pen of bodies, but so okay. So you're you're, you're all, uh, is <laughs> is there basically one? I thought someone mentioned like Scottish constitution, didn't they? Do you have varieties of lodges in Australia that are not that do things slightly different, like the emulation right in England? Do you have lodges that are like that? Anybody? Uh, we've got three in Victoria that are warranted to work different rituals. Interesting. One, works, okay. one is a Filipino lodge that works Filipino ritual. Ah. One is a Scottish lodge that works the McBride ritual. And ah. one is a ordinary craft lodge that works the RER ritual from Belgium. Oh, very cool. Okay. But they're sanctioned. You're... So a tip, your typical grant, your typical lodge has the same ritual as other craft lodges, but you have a few that the grand lodge gives them permission to have a different right. Yeah, and, and, uh, and you all can attend. You can go visit them and watch their degrees. Yeah, they're they're considered a normal. They're a normal warranted Victorian lodge. They're just allowed okay. to work this different ritual <laughs> and actually initiate candidates through that ritual. Um, but here we do have those other rights, but um, America's unique in that you've put them all into those two systems. So you've got the ancient and accepted right. We have that here, but it's just another right. It's not right. all well, encompassing yeah, like it is in the US. And then we have all the other orders, but we don't group them under the York right. We just have all those orders. So you're very, you say you're very similar to England in that you have the Mark Master Mason and you have the Royal Arch and the Cryptic Mason. Okay, so very all of that stuff. That. We've covered that yep. before. Yes, but they're all completely separate. Now, are they all like? In, go ahead. Uh, in New South Wales, we have what I would call a bastardised uh, ritual. It's made uh -huh. up of uh, the English, Irish, and Scottish constitutions. Which I was call uh, it <laughs> well, uh, that's my turn. We take, it's, we actually, take, it's actually worked we, at a lodge in Canada, the New South okay. Wales ritual. That, that's wow. okay. It's, that's your way of interpreting it. My way is they take the best out of each of those and, yeah, put, it, and put it together. But now, so just to be clear, it. go ahead, sorry. Okay. So, so in, uh, well, Okay, if I take Brendan's task on that, like uh, <laughs> I, I use that term because I, it's colloquially what I would use. But right. uh, in, in effect, we take bits and pieces so of uh -huh. of the English, Irish, and Scottish constitution and put them together, and that's where we've got the New South Wales ACT ritual. Interesting. Well, okay. So in America, Virginia now Virginia is slightly different, but Typically, for American lodges, you have what's now. This is where you can have a whole discussion on what's York. In my opinion, 
unless you tell me you're something different, you're ignored, right? But people say, we're not. It's like, well, what are you? Are you American, right? No such thing. But basically, we inherited the English system, what's, what was primarily from England, and it's called the York right, even though people argue it doesn't come from York, but it is called the York right. But the, the whole Preston Webb ritual, the whole, basically how American lodges are structured is, is right. And I think a lot of Masons don't realize the difference between a right and a ritual. But basically, if you, if you have to be a man, if you have to believe in a supreme being, um, and if we have the three degrees and that's it, that's your right. And if you vary differently from that, you're called something else. But now, within the York Rite as an appended body, we have the Royal Arch chapter, which is Mark Master the Royal Arch. We have the cryptic, the council degrees, which is three degrees, sometimes two. And then we have the commander, which is the knights, the orders. In Virginia, we absorbed the cryptic degrees, Mark and Select Master, into the Royal Arch. So you get those along the way to get into the Royal Arch. And then you can join the command. So we only have three bodies on the York right side, Blue Lodge, Royal Arch, Commander. And, but Virginia, West Virginia are unique in that sense. But they're completely appended bodies. They are not, you have to be a Mason to join them. Um, and you have in most Supreme Councils in the world, the Scottish right confers the first three degrees. And in America, that was not allowed. Um, there were... A, in order to be considered regular, the Scottish Rite, the Supreme Council, let's say the, the Mother Council, had to agree to not confer the first three degrees. You must be a Master Mason to join the Scottish Rite. Whereas in most places in the world, you could go knock on the door of a Scottish Rite valley or whatever they call it, and get your entered apprentice EA and fellow craft in the Scottish Rite ritual and get all of your degrees in the Scottish Rite. And it's its own Right. Whereas in America, it's not. It's an appended body. But you yeah. are very similar to England, and they're basically appended bodies, all of them. Ancient and accepted right doesn't, can, they started the secret master, correct? You know? uh, yeah, and the administration of them varies from state to state. In WA, they all come under the chapter, the whole lot. Really? You join, you join the chapter, and they manage everything. The Royal Arch, the Royal Arch chapter? Or, yep. Yep. So they do the mark, the cryptic, the whole lot. Okay. All right. Um, in the, in the United States, uh, yep. think that the the council <coughs> is, um, separate, except in Virginia and West Virginia. Yes. Ones, and that you and you're talking about Scottish right first three degrees. There are a few lodges. I don't know how many. I think in Louisiana. The yes, North, the Scottish right. That's right. That's the exception. There's a there. Louisiana is funny. <laughs> Louisiana <laughs> has a Supreme Council that is considered irregular by the Southern jurisdiction. So I can't go visit a um, Louisiana Supreme Council, but they are literally their own Supreme Council just for the state of Louisiana. In know. addition to and separate from that, there are a handful of lodges under the Grand Lodge of Louisiana that are regular lodges that confer the Scottish Rite to Greeks. So uh, Louisiana is an interesting place. <laughs> Very interesting. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see. Li uh, let's see. Try to stay in order. Linz, uh, how long does it take typically for, for a man to go from EA to fellow craft or master mason? And do they have catechisms along the way or uh no so uh i think uh, in victoria there has to be about at least three months well that used to be the case between um degrees right. um we we do um we don't have to learn a catechism but there's a, a series of questions and answers that are uh, asked ah, prior okay. to the beginning, beginning of the following degree and right. uh generally uh with a little bit of prompting from someone standing behind if there's a uh, <laughs> Someone who gets their their, um, their lines, yeah, yeah. But generally, um, generally within twelve months, you'll be able to go from uh, from the EA to the third degree. But now, is the does the Grand Lodge say you must wait three months before you get the next degree? I mean, there's a rule you have to wait. They, a certain time. they did, but they just removed all of those requirements. 
Okay. And left because, it up to the lodge to decide. Okay. See, now, because that sounds like an artificial rule. Now, in Virginia, it's because you have to learn the catechism. Some brothers take longer than others. If you're really good at ritual, you can get all three degrees in a month or so if you can learn the catechism quickly enough. Typically, it's about three or four months because the candidate takes that long to learn like the EA catechism. And then the fellow crap usually is faster because the, 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 the questions are almost the same. So you're always like, well, I'm on the second degree. So, you know, you, you just change a word and you got the same answers. Uh, but it's up to the candidate how quickly he can go. Then just by comparison, if you cannot get, if you cannot stand your EA catechism within three to six months of being initiated, you have to write a letter to the lodge and request a six-month extension. At the end of the year, if you're not ready, you have to write a lodge and letter again. And quite often, you won't get, you'll know, basically say no. <laughs> but you have to have extenuating circumstances if it took you 12 months to learn the EA. But it's totally driven by the candidate. If you're if you're fast, you, it's up to you to get through at your own pace. There's no artificial like you must wait a certain amount of time. Here's um, a question for you: yes, How many questions ahead. in your entered apprentice uh, catechism? Well, since it's not written down, <laughs> it takes about twenty minutes to go through the catechism. The obligation takes at least like five minutes to recite. Um, Ballpark. I've never counted them all. I'd say forty or fifty questions. That's a rough guess. Well, the <laughs> Filipino lodge here, which I think is based on Californian ritual, I think that's where the Filipinos got their ritual yes. from. Yes. Is fifty six. Their Victorian equivalent is ten. Okay. All right. And yeah, we really we do. short <laughs> ten. Yeah, and we have the alternate method we've rolled out here in Virginia for people who don't have time to, I guess, memorize their catechism. And it is very much, it's short, and you have to show the Dugar signs and the, the grips and all, but you don't have to memorize the obligation, for example. We had a brother who came in um, through the, uh, the alternate method, and... On his own, he said, okay, now that I'm a Master Mason, I want to do it the right way. And he went and learned the catechisms and stood them. And I was quite impressed that he didn't have to, but he made that was name is Drain and Sparks. He went on to be master. He's a good guy. But he said, I, I felt like it wasn't fair to the lodge that I that I didn't do it the right way. Now, with, uh, to talk about the one-day conferral, they have six months to learn basically the alternate method. Or if they want to learn the catechisms, they can they have to stand at least the alternate method in order to be uh, fully considered a master mason within six months of this one day conferral. But it's kind of messy. It's like, well, what happens if he doesn't? I mean, he's already paid dues. He's already a member. So it gets kind of sort of like, let's find a way to get these guys in, but bend the rules. Um, Linz, are there lectures for each degree? Uh, <clears throat> Like at the end Not of the no. no. Now lectures. Yes, yeah. yes, Tracy Board lectures. Brendan, are there? Or do you have Yes, there's one for each degree, a tracing board lecture. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, we have one for each, and it's half of it's written down in the manual of work and half of it is by word of mouth. So it's like if someone wants to learn it, I say go and read this in the manual of work. And when you've memorized all of the writ parts. I'll get with you and fill in the blanks. <laughs> I enjoy the lectures. I think the lectures are great. I had a lot of fun when I was in England, uh, Italy. I attended a lodge, Harry S. Truman Lodge. It's a military lodge. I was a contractor. Most everybody in the room was either a, uh, a senior chief in the Navy or a contractor. But they're all Americans. It was technically, they were chartered in the Grand Lodge of California, and they used Connecticut ritual officially. <laughs> Unofficially, most of the guys were from Virginia, so the ritual was almost identical to what I knew. But I'm sitting there watching the EA, uh, a fellow craft degree, rather, and I know this, the senior vegans lecture was the first one I learned. And I'm listening. I'm like, okay, okay, okay. And halfway through, nope. Went on for about 10 minutes. I had no idea what they were talking about. And then they swerved back into, oh, yes, this part I know again. So 
they inserted something in the middle, totally alien to what I had memorized. So they had my whole lecture with a bunch of stuff in the middle that I'd never seen. So I guess that was Connecticut or maybe California ritual. I'm not sure. So it was, it's always fun to see the differences. Uh, Linz, are, what are your, oh, I'm sorry, no, yeah. Uh, Richard, sorry. What are your dues for your lodge? Well, the lodge dues would be uh, probably around about, uh, say, $140, and then the grand lodge dues on top of that will be another wow. $140. Yeah. Wow, it's that? Okay, so now that, I'm sorry, is that the Australian dollar, or is that? Okay. Yeah, Australian dollars. And yeah. so do you know what that is to compare to the American dollar, just for a frame well, of reference? It's about, it's about uh, 60 cents is one Australian dollar. Okay. So it's more so 180 or something. Okay. But yeah, so yeah. all told, it's $280 Australian. Wow. Uh, are there other costs, Richard? Like, you know, do you pay for the dinners or you just everybody's paid, put the money in a basket or a, a, do you have other regular expenses? Oh, you, costs? You, you're asked to make a contribution, but the contribution is pretty minimal. It might be $5, it might be 10 But there okay. are some lodges where they have, where they have a proper sit-down meal. And it might be sixty, seventy dollars. Okay, for a special meeting. Okay. Yep. Can y'all hear the concert in the background? They just picked up. Nope. I hear it going. I, I'm, usually, well, I mean, it's it's away, so I can hear it a little bit, but I don't know if y'all can. Um, okay, uh, Graham, how do you dress for lodge? What's typical? We've got daylight meetings. They uh, require a suit and tie or jacket and tie. Yep. And uh, well, for evening meet for evening uh, uh, meetings, it's uh, a dinner suit and bow tie. Okay. That's like tuxedo or dinner jacket. Yeah, tuxedo. Yeah. Okay. Alrighty. Uh, and the uh, I, I can't see all of the chat some people are replying in the chat so if you want to just pipe in so everybody can hear you you're welcome to um uh, uh brendan do you buy your own aprons or like does the does the master get an apron how do how do your aprons um you get your entered apprentice and fellow craft apron inside your at the end of your degree you're given a pack ah, and that includes okay. your apron some books on what's just happened. You get the ritual of that degree, um, but everyone else, you've got to buy your aprons, your master mason apron, your your um, master's apron, all of uh, that. Everyone buy buys them. The, okay. And you wear it now. Are they decorative? Are they? I mean, are they different? Or are they all kind of this? They look the same? Or how was that? Um. I, I gather in a lot of American lodges, your master mason's apron, unless you're in office, looks a lot like an entered apprentice apron. Correct. It's just plain white lamp. Yes. Yeah, you put the flap up. You either yep. put one corner up. Right. Uh, for us, your master mason's apron is our entered apprentice apron. Our fellow craft apron has two blue rosettes on it. And then the... Master, past master's apron has the little triple towels, three of yes. those, okay. and three blue rosettes. But they're standardized. Everyone wears the same looking master mason. Okay. Yep. Now in Virginia, a past master, typically the past master is given a nice past master's apron from the lodge. It's white with blue trim, you know, it's got a blue border and got a nice past master's logo in the middle with a little leaves or whatever around it you know the ivy um my lodge my mother lodge charles steve morton gave me a uh, and by the way pete was a member of charles Morton for me um they gave me an apron in 1996 so i have 1996 embroidered on the bottom they gave me that and it's nice it's leather it's got nice ropes um i wore that for years when i was elected master of ocean view that i affiliated with i had 2012 sewn on the little the, the point of the flap where there's like the blue, you know, down the middle, there's the triangle where well, that's a flap. I had 2012 with there. So when I wear it, it's 2012 and 2016. It didn't make sense to me or sorry. 
No, not, I'm sorry, 1996 and 2012, 16 years apart. Um, I didn't see the sense in get, having the Lodge give me a second past master's apron since I've been wearing mine for 16 years. So I thought I'd save them money and I just simply had it embroidered with both years on it. But that's just me. Uh, but the Lodge will pay. And what, my, what Ocean View does actually is they have a nice apron that's made up that you wear for a year and it has the past eight masters emblem on it just like mine but it's it's just like the lodge officers eight words it's it's stiffer it's a little bigger and there's this white leather piece that like is velcroed in that has the square so for the year your master you wear that apron everywhere you go and it shows the square because you're the city master and the end of that time you peel off the velcro uh, I don't know what you do with that flap. I guess you put it away somewhere, the little the little piece you take off. But you don't wear it again. You have the past masters underneath. So it's your apron. But I really like mine because I was able to buy a nice uh, laptop case that zips up, and I just fold it in half, and it fits in there. I didn't want these big portfolio size apron cases some guys have that are like, you know, 20-some inches by 18-some. They're, they're huge. My thing is, like, if you think of a laptop case, if I had mine, I'd show it to you, but, you know, it just zips up, and I fold it in half, and it fits good in there, and it holds a, you know, a manila folder with all of my papers that I'm taking somewhere, and my gloves, so, and my cigars, so I've got a nice traveling case when I need to go anywhere, but I wear that past master's apron everywhere I go, and what's funny is, in Virginia Research, because I'm an officer now, I had to break my habit, Pete moved out for it, I ride with him, I had to break my habit of bringing my apron, because I didn't need it. Because I had, a, I'm wearing the senior warm apron for now. It's like if I don't need to bring it, I don't need to bring it. But that's kind of where I. That's like my traveling briefcase. Hold on. So, and Robert's yelling at us. Oh, you got your hands up, Robert? Or are you just? <laughs> All right. Um, let's see. That was. I lost track. I'm sorry, Richard. You're next. I hope. Uh, do you have the green nights, or do you always work on your like? How often did your lodge meet, and do you have separate degree nights, or you do work on business nights? How does that work? Oh, we tend to meet eleven times a year, and uh, if there's a if there's a candidate to have a degree, we'll do the degree. Okay. Otherwise, we might have a quiz or uh, some sort of educational thing, but it's mainly mainly degree work. But you you don't have you. It's a stated meeting, so like you can vote for candidates and all that. You do business oh, yes. at each meeting. You don't have call yes. communications. No. And the any, any, and the business, the business is all done in the first degree. Ah, okay. Um, so it's not done in the third degree like it is scale. in America. Go ahead, Brendan. We didn't have a Morgan scandal. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, well, that's why you guys do it all in the third degree. I think well, so. Some, yeah, we meet. Yeah. We meet in the Master Masons. Um, some states well, do it in the first degree, like uh, Arizona does the first degree. Yes, yes. Um, in Virginia, I think is typical, but a lot of them do work on the EA now. In Virginia, we have our stated meetings. So, like Ocean View meets on the second Friday of every month, and that's the only time. At a stated, is the only time you can vote. You can do actual business, vote on a candidate you know, pay bills, stuff like that. We do not do degree work at a state. In. At most, we might let someone return their Master Mason's catechism, but we can't, We don't ever do degree work. Uh, we have call communications on any other Friday of the month where we, we meet open an EA Lodge for the EA go home. Now, to give you an example of how strange it was at one time when I joined, you had to open on the Master Mason's degree at a call communication. So consider this. You go to Lodge. You have an EA who's doing his catechism and you're going to pass it to Fellowcraft. You open the enter to print, You open the Master Mason's Lodge. Salute the flag. Only the Master Mason's are in the room. You then call off. You bring in the entered apprentices if you have any, including like your, your candidate who's going to stand his catechism. You open an entered apprentice lodge. You don't have to do the prayers, but you open the EA Lodge. You you examine him in the entered apprentice degree. You close the entered apprentice degree. You open the fellow crafts degree. 
You then bring in the candidate and pass him to the degree of fellow craft. You then close the fellow craft's degree and he can sit there. Then you kick him out in any of the fellow crafts. You reopen, you call on the Master Mason's Lodge from uh, who refresh or from, uh, yeah, from late, well, not late refreshment, you call back on the Master Mason's Lodge and then you close the Master Mason's Lodge. You had to do all that in a single night. Thankfully, in like the early 90s, Someone had, had good sense and said, okay, forget that. If you're going to work in the EA degree, you just open and close the EA lodge, and that's all you have to do. But it was crazy how you had to do that. Now, Pete, Pete and I were members of Charles T. Morton. I left. Pete was still with them till they, till they closed down. They got to the point where they were paying rent at Norview Lodge with their meeting. They couldn't afford to meet more than once a month, so they literally would do all their degree nights on a stated night because they didn't want to pay rent two nights a month. So that's how it get for a smaller lodge that's, you know, count pennies. Uh, they only would meet 12 times a year, and if they had any degree work, it would happen on their stated. But that's pretty much, that's the situation that lodge felt, found itself in. Virtually every other lodge around here, we just open on a call. We have a call communication, do our business, and go on. Um, we had, go ahead. We had, we had times where only the officers were present, and that was most of our meetings. Mm -hmm. Yep, I can't imagine. I can't imagine trying to get through a master mason's degree with just the officers. That's like mm -hmm. bring in the one fellow craft. <laughs> um, let's see, uh, Graham. Do you? Oh, we already covered three nights. Okay, is there a difference? Oh. Are your um, well? I guess you have Graham. You have your annual meetings where you elect your your you install the new officers, but that's basically the only difference. Then will be the annuals. So you're asking, like your annual meeting would have a little more business, but it's typical yeah. like your other ones. Uh, we we're similar to some of the other states in Victoria. Sorry, in uh, Australia. Where okay. we will have the the three degrees, and we only open in the one degree that we work in. And if we work, if we pass candidates, we move up into the the various degrees and do it that way. Right. Uh, when we install the master, is that what you're asking? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was. Well, I, the question was you already you guys already answered the question of whether you have called communication. So my question was, um, do you have a difference between in annual, a stated, and a degree nine. But since you typically don't have degree nights, it's not quite the same thing. So, yeah. Graham, let me ask you then, do you, um, at, uh, when you have your regular business meetings, so you open on the EA degree, can an editor apprentice ballot on a candidate, vote on bills or anything, or are they, they're just absolute. a... Uh, well, uh, absolutely, they get the right to vote on any issue that's before the lodge because it's in that in that degree. Um, right. Okay. So you read a and, petition. You open on the EA degree, and you read a petition and ballot on it in the EA, and all of your EAs get to battle along with the bids. Okay. Absolutely. Now, by comparison, of course, in in Virginia, you don't pay dues to your master mason, so you have no. You have some rights as a mason, like as an EA or a fellow craft. In Virginia, you don't get to wear a ring. You don't get to ballot. You don't get to vote. You don't get to attend business meetings because we're not open on that degree. And if you happen to die as an EA, you don't get uh, Masonic rights. So you have some rights as an EA and a fellow craft, but you don't get all your full rights and benefits to your master mason. But again, you don't pay dues to your master mason. So that's that's kind of the trade-off. But that gives you the incentive, of course, that you want to get through your catechism so you can fully participate in the lodge. Um, Brendan, um, is there more than one volume of sacred law on the altar? Uh, in a couple of lodges, yes. Majority okay. of lodges, it's the King James. But in right. lodges where there's Islamic members or... Hindu members, etc. There's other books out. We have three fairly predominant Jewish lodges. And okay. They'll have their own their own volume out. But whether you're doing degree work or not for that candidate, you, you still you you put all the volumes out. So it's like Rudyard Kipling had in India, where 
there'd be five or six books. Okay. And that's every meeting. See, I, I think it's yeah, kind of cool. But... It's like the lodges in Singapore. They have about eight or nine out on theirs. They've got a special table for, for that many of them. Oh, my goodness. Okay. But that's, and again, that's to, that's out of respect to all of your members that have nothing to do with the individual candidate. Now, of course, that candidate, his, if you had a Muslim candidate, the, the Quran would be center stage and have those squaring compasses on it for his obligation. Okay. Interesting. I, I kind of like that idea myself. Um, of course, Virginia, you know, typically Virginia, we have Jews and Protestants pretty much. I mean, that's, that's us. We, there are a few Muslim brothers, not many. Um, I know we've allowed, we, I think we've used a Quran once or twice. If the candidate has asked for his own holy book, for his obligation, we'll use it. But typically, we will only have the Holy Bible on the old for any time. Um, yeah. Brendan, oh, so go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, in Virginia, even though we have Jewish members, we still use the King James Version. That's correct. Even when they're in Lodge. Right, we don't. Well, I suppose the, uh, you just open it at the front half. Well, actually, all of the the three different books, uh, the three different um, verses are all in the Old Testament. This it's uh, it's um, let's see if I know Corinthians and um, wow, man, I'm drawing a blank. Um, Genesis. No, 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 not Genesis. Uh, I'd have to look it up. I'm okay. sorry. I should be better prepared. Um, if I could see, I'd, I'd, I'd look it up. But yeah, it's uh, you know, um, it's the passage that's used in the EA, the fellow crap, when you bring the candidate around the room without getting too much details. You read a Bible verse, and it's that verse which the book Amos. Amos would see us that it's open to Amos, and it's open to Corinthians, and it's open to one other one. I can't remember what it is. Okay. Um, <clears throat> go ahead. No, oh, it, okay. It's uh, 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 yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so that's but, why I have my researchers on site. A blank again. <laughs> What's that? I do um, a blank. <laughs> okay, um, Brandon, where are the or yeah, where are the three candles? Uh, our candles have morphed into lights on the top of the pillars next to the mud. The master and two wardens. So we no longer have three lights out on the pavement. Okay, so, so all so three. They let have me do their pillars. They have their pillars next to them, and there's a light now on the top of their pillars. Are they in the east, west, and south? Yes. Or master wards? Okay. Because some grand lodges, apparently, the it, some lodges, all three are sitting in the east. Okay. Uh, this is a question I added because my Canadian brother, uh, Cameron Adamson, was doing a uh, one of our early Zoom meetings. I don't know if anybody here was around for that. He talked about Winchester Lodge, Winchester Masonic Temple in Winchester, Canada. And he basically gave us a tour. It's a very famous building in that city. It's like, you know, six stories and a lot of lodges meet there and they do public events and other things. But he was showing us pictures and I said, whoa, where's the G? And the G was suspended over the altar. So I added this question. So, uh, Linz, where is the letter G in your blue lodge? Uh, generally, it hangs from the uh, the ceiling in the center of the lodge above the uh, See? above the pipe. See, y'all are just y'all are just wrong. No, just kidding. Uh, so that's typical for Australia. Then that it's, it's over the altar <clears throat> in the center. Except of the, lodge. the altar moves as well. Victoria doesn't have it in the middle of the pavement. Where is it in the east? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. In Virginia, it's in the east above the mast. Okay. Um, no, no, but the actual altar itself, most American lodges, you have it in the middle of the pavement. Yes, right in the middle. Yes. Here in Victoria, we don't. Pavement's empty. Oh, the, the altar's in what? At the foot of the east then? Yeah, it's part of the master's pedestal. Interesting. So the candidate's obligated up in the east. Okay, interesting. Um, Lynn, let's see. And I'm sorry, I'm trying to keep you all in order. If I skip around, forgive me. Um, Lynn, uh, no, I did ask Liz. Richard, where, what are some of your working tours? Oh, what we've got three in each degree. Okay. And uh, 
So, uh, yeah, we have the... Uh, 24 inch gauge, common 24 gallon, gauge, and the chisel. Yeah, and then we don't the have the chisel. Wooden, yeah. Right. Um, and then we have the, uh, the square and the level and the plumb in the second degree. And, uh, same for us. And there's also three in the master mason's degree. There's no working tools in the installed master's degree in right. Australia. Well, what are they in the, the master mason's? We just have the... Uh, the, the, skirret, the skirret, the pencil, and the compasses. You don't have the trowel? No. Oh, interesting. Okay, okay. We even here in Victoria moved the word, removed the word trowel from the ritual. Really? Very interesting. Okay. Um, some, of our, go ahead. some of our lodges have the trowel in their seal. Right. Or the okay. emblem. But, but they don't talk about it. That okay. means they're Irish. Ah. <laughs> yeah, they were um, Irish. Yeah, the Irish always have the trowel in their symbol. Right. Yeah. Um, Richard, do you have, um, are the ancient landmarks um, spelled out, written down, enumerated in your Grand Lodge? In South Australia, they had the 25 landmarks from Mackey's List in okay. 18... Around about 1880s. Yep. Uh, but then there was a big dispute about it. And then when they brought out the next book of the second edition of the Book of Constitutions, that part was omitted from the book. Okay. Uh, yeah. So there's still argument about it, but there's probably only there's probably only about two or three landmarks. We don't really talk about them very much. Or if we do, right. it's a non-productive discussion. Yes. Interesting. Okay. Um Graham, do you have, do you serve a meal, a dinner, or snacks, or anything? Do you serve food before or after your meetings, Tim? Uh, after the meetings, uh, for uh, evening lodges. Uh, okay. Some of the daylight lodges, they will call off and have a meal halfway through and then call back on. Okay. And others, and others will continue all the way through and have the meal at the end of the of the state of Mogan. Okay. Um, Brendan, do and you don't have... don't forget we drink alcohol as well. Well, I'm getting... Uh, not not um, in all lodges. Most. All right. Well, yeah. we're, we're, we're going to come... We're going to get to that. Um, do you have social occasions, Brendan? Um, uh, you know, yes. Yeah, lodges, it's up to them to, you know, organise social events. Lots do. They'll have barbecue outings or whatever. Okay. Um, pretty... It's an individual lodge thing, how much you have of the social calendar. Okay. Um, and, uh, Lynn, do you invite wives and family members to any of your dinners or any social functions? Yeah, generally um, they, they would be invited uh, to attend at the, uh, in the south, which is where we have our supper after the, the meal. Uh, and okay. certainly there are a big part of any social functions that would, uh, that would take place. Okay. Um, Richard, do you have co-masonry or any mixed or female lodges in Australia? Uh, well, in my in my state, we've got one lodge with females only, uh, you do? and that comes that comes under the order of women Freemasons in London, and we've also got one co-masons lodge, but we're not allowed to attend any of those. Uh, the women's only right. the women's only lodge does rent. Uh, our lodge premises for their meetings, and they're held on a Saturday. But no men are allowed in the building. Okay, so they're they're not rec they're not regular to you all. They're not recognised, but they do meet. Yeah, there. correct. Okay, interesting. Okay, that's starting to become more of a thing here in America, where apparently uh, there is a slight movement to bring about COVID. <laughs> that's a whole other discussion by itself. But okay, um, Graham, do you have men? Uh, well, we mentioned religion already, but. Are men of every race welcome in your lodges? Is there any kind of social stigma for I mean, you do have Aborigines, which might compare in a way to the blacks in America and their difficulties with the rest of us stuck up white people. Uh, do you have like no. racial issues or can any man be uh, any race be a member of the lodges or is that ever an issue anywhere? No, we don't. Uh, in New South Wales, we don't have a problem with race. Uh, we've got. Uh, um, an Aboriginal member in our own lodge. 
um, up there. And uh, we we don't have a problem. Uh, they just have to be free in, of mature age. Right. Very good. Okay. I mean, you all know enough about Prince Hall. I don't want to delve into that. That was a big schism here in America that's rather embarrassing. And it's one of those things where, <laughs> look, it happened over 200 years ago. I wasn't there to complain about it. I can't do much about it other than advocate that we recognize our Prince Hall Grand Lodges. And maybe down the road, we may eventually merge all together, but that's more of a logistical thing. And I don't see it happening anytime soon, but we only have four Grand Lodges left in America, mainstream or state lodges, Grand Lodges, that don't recognize their Prince Hall counterpart. Virginia's recognized ours since late 90s or 2000, whatever it was, and we now have several others that we should recognize and asked us, like the Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Alaska asked Virginia to recognize them. We did. I didn't realize there were enough black men in Alaska to actually have a Grand Lodge, but there are. Are, they, are you allowed to visit them? Yes, and actually in Virginia, until recently, it had to be more of a formal thing where you coordinate with both grand secretaries and it'd be like Virginia Research actually had a whole contingent of about 20 Prince Hall Masons from Virginia came and visited. And the, the current grand secretary, he was past grand master of Prince Hall in Virginia, was our guest speaker. The most interesting part, and that actually, that event, in my mind, I think what inspires me to do these panel discussions because we had our guest speaker and he talked about the history of Prince Hall of Virginia. And it was all very interesting. But what I remember is once he was finished, the master of Virginia Research opened up the floor and just any brother could ask a question across the way of, you know, between the two. And I think one of us asked the Prince Hall brothers, like, what do you see is really different between us? And one guy stood up and said, Look at y'all. You, you're in a, a a sport coat, a bright sport coat, and a colorful tie. You're in a sport coat. You're in that kind of suit. You're in that kind of suit. All of us, every one of us, black suit, white shirt, black tie, black shoes, period. That is very strict. They would not even wear colorful ties in their meeting. They were blown away that we're all there in like sport coats and, you know, typical lodge dress. They couldn't believe we were that casual. So it was very enlightening to, to contrast and compare um, how Prince Hall does business compared to the, the state Grand Lodge. And honestly, we, we kind of fall short because they take it much more seriously than we do. And they talk about a guy petitions to join a Prince Hall Lodge. They get to know him. They get to know that we didn't have a, a um, we just recently added a criminal background check in Virginia. You have to pay another twenty-five dollars, and they run a federal background check to see if you have a criminal past. And if you lied, and it comes out, you have to explain yourself, or they won't let you. Have to justify why you didn't tell the truth. But we have to decide as a lodge if we let you in. If your background check had anything suspicious, well, for the Prince Hall, this is again about fifteen, twenty years ago. They do background checks. They keep tabs on you if you're an entered apprentice. They're watching you. They're watching you, how you interact in the world as you're going through it. If you mess up, if you're out there being the fool somewhere, they may not let you be a fellow crap. They actually pay closer attention as you're coming through. And we're sort of like, if your check clears, you can learn the catechism to let you in. It's kind of like, you know, we only do one check at the beginning. They're much stricter, and I give them great props for that. They're, they hold the standards higher than we do. I thought that was quite interesting. Um, Brendan, what, uh, I don't know if this applies, but I'll ask anyway, what language is all in your meeting tell me? Is, is Australia typically, you all speak Australian? Australian uh, English? Yeah. What do you call it? Yes. Australian? English. Yeah, English. no, we, we all speak English. We have an Italian lodge that's allowed to work an Italian ritual once a okay. year if they want to, but they haven't done it in years. Okay. Well, other than the, does, do the Fili Filipinos meet in they speak in Tagalog. Uh, they, they speak English as well. Yeah, no, they don't do they don't do it all in Tagalog. Okay. Now, to be fair, I, I recycle questions from previous meetings. Um, I'm interested in places that are not where English is not the primary language. You know, one language to speak. Obviously, you all are speaking English, so it's not typically an issue. Um, Lids are men of every class of society in your lodge. Are you white collar, blue collar, a mix? Is there any kind of how does that pan out? Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Certainly, um, the only prohibition would probably be having a criminal record would preclude uh-huh. you from being a member of the lodge. But otherwise, we have uh, tradesmen um, and uh, all the way up to professionals, doctors, lawyers, right. um, police officers, all that sort of thing. Do you still have a lot of professionals, doctors, lawyers, and so on? I mean, no. I, I, I think certainly metropolitan there is a number of them, but I, I would say the vast majority of people are made up from um, blue collar. Uh, from blue, blue collar. Is, is blue collar a thing? And I, I mean, I'm using American terms, I know, but is blue collar a. Yeah. Yeah, when I say blue collar, you all know yeah. what I mean. Right? No, we do. Yeah. Okay, okay. Blue collar white. All right. Uh, now, the most important question uh, Richard, do you have cigars who are smoking in your lodge? Or after the meetings or what? <laughs> no smoking. Uh, no smoking probably for 20 plus years. Uh, no, no such cool. thing as cigar okay. nights. Okay. We have not even nights. afterwards, not, not in the buildings no. at all. Do no. any of you all, I'll ask the whole group, any of you have, okay. No, it's, it's totally illegal to smoke inside a, a building, public building. Oh, really? Oh, oh okay. okay. Complete ban on it. In, so um, you've got to go outside and smoke cigarettes. Right. You can go cigars. out and right. <laughs> Okay. Typically, now, Ocean View, I think, is a little different. I think we do things a little bit better than some other lodges in our district. Uh, for those of you, I've mentioned it before, but y'all may not know, we have Granby Street, which is a very large Masonic building in Norfolk, which is in, in the area I live in. I'm in Virginia Beach, so I'm on you know, the water we have Virginia Beach, Chesapeake, and Norfolk are all kind of in the same general area. Each city has their own uh, their own district, and we kind of share Scottish Rite, Royal Arch, and all that. But the joke in Hampton Roads, which is what we call this area, is you live in one city, you work in another, and you go to lodge in a third. And that's true for most of us. Most of my Masonic ties are to Norfolk because I was in the Marines stationed in Norfolk when I got started. I've never joined anything out at the beach um, other than like a research chapter. And I still go to Norfolk for all my meetings. But Granby Street, at one time, Granby Street had, um, I think, 10 or 11 blue lodges. Right now, at our heyday, we had 11. I think we're about eight lodges. We had two Royal Arch chapters, a commandery, a Scottish Rite, a, um, two, two Royal Arch, Scottish Rite, commandery, Four Eastern Star chapters, an Amaranth Port, two Joby Bethels, one Rainbow Assembly, one DMLA chapter, all men in the same building. A lot of those have gone away. We still have about eight blue lodges. But Granby Street, you used to be able to smoke upstairs in one room and in the hallway, and they banned smoking through the whole building. Ocean View owns our own building. We're a typical lodge where you have a two story building, lodge rooms upstairs, dining hall downstairs, and we set up like a fourth, like a quarter of the downstairs and put in some big comfortable couches and easy chairs in one centering around like a big ottoman. And we have a TV that never gets turned on. But that's our man cave. And we would sit there and smoke cigars in the man cave after the meetings. We could have a school night or a lodge meeting or a degree night. And we're going to be there at least two hours afterwards sitting around talking socializing we can't have alcohol but we we do smoke cigars most of us we've gotten to where most of us smoke outside if it's nice out but cigars are a big culture within ocean view and just being able to smoke afterwards is we've we've encouraged the fellowship afterwards and the hanging around kind of like what we're doing here the social afterwards and that's that's gone a long way to keep our lodge uh, vibrant um it's just a strange lodge What's that? That's it. You're just, oh, Ocean View is just a strange lodge. We are. We are. That's why we won't let you in, Pete. <laughs> we, will, I promise, we wouldn't let you in, I promise. Feel free to fill uh, That's our trade-off. No smoking in the building, but we can drink alcohol. At right. So, Brendan, you can answer that. So, you can, you can have alcohol, well, not during the meetings, I think, but like after the meetings? No. What? Uh, and my lodge of research now meets in the upstairs room of a pub. Okay, so you go downstairs and have drinks afterwards. Uh, no, we actually dine in the room. So oh, okay. we call off 
And we're a research lodge, so we don't do ceremonial work. Right. But we actually call off, tell them to bring the dinners in at 8 o'clock. 8 o'clock, there's a knock on the door. In come the dinners. Okay. And then, we, then we have our speaker, etc. call back on and close Very the lodge. Good. Now, you don't have, staying with, with, with uh, Brendan there, you don't have a table lodge like we do in Virginia. Like the, the festive, well, it's not really a festive board. I wouldn't call it a festive board, but that's the closest our table lodge is to it. You don't have, you um, have festive boards? or? Well, we, we call our, our supper a festive board. Okay. Okay. Uh, but, but research actually meets at table. So we're we're conducting the meeting and dining at the table. So it's it's not set up like a lodge room. It's set up like it would have been three hundred years ago. Very good. I think we should we should emulate that. Well, Virginia has a table lodge, which is act uh, actually, actually. Go ahead. The, the way we meet looks a lot like the recent um, um, Andrew Hammer movie they put out on Masonic dining. Oh. Okay. And have you seen that? I have not. Oh, my ah, Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'd, I'd recommend you go and have a look at it. I, I showed it on one of the Sunday nights recently, and Andrew even turned up, which meant it would have been 3 o'clock in the morning for him, but he turned up as well. Wow. I would like to see that. Um, so we're not allowed. Virginia is not allowed alcohol in the meetings at all, period. Um, we're not. We just can't serve alcohol. Um, I, okay, I'm going to have to pause for one minute and go uh, plug in my laptop. So if you all want to discuss amongst yourself for a minute, I'll be right back. Um, brothers, earlier on, for those of you who are um, American Masons and not familiar with a working tool that's usually English, English Masonry was mentioned, the skirt. This is a skirt. That's, that's one. It's a thing. It, it's a spool of, thread, of of cord and a spike, and it's used to draw a straight line for laying bricks. Uh, and bricklayers use it all the time, but we never hear uh, ever hear of this thing called a skirt. But this is a ceremonial one, and. It has a, I've seen one, an old one at the Philadelphia Grand Lodge building uh, in, Pencil, in uh, Pennsylvania Grand, and there it's a full school thing. So. <laughs> yeah, they're a bit like, um, as you say, the old bricklayers uh, line that they'd put out with the chalk on it. They'd flick the line and that would leave a chalk mark along where they'd work. And, and, of course, a pencil is a pencil. <laughs> <laughs> and, they all operate on a cent and they all operate on a center pin. I also agree that in the entered apprentice degree, there should be, instead, in addition to the, uh, there should be a chisel, because what do you, if you whale away on a stone with a, a hammer, what are you going to do? Have a bunch of pebbles. <laughs> And we say the chisel represents. <laughs> we say the chisel represents education. Yeah, I, I appreciate y'all actually keeping it going. I'll, I'll catch up on that when I watch some recording. Uh, I'm sorry, I was down to 19 percent, and my laptop was yelling at me. I didn't know how to make the whole meeting, but I got the camera going. I've got the uh, everything, so I had to put power. I had to plug power in. Uh, okay, uh, thank you for bearing with me as I stepped out. Um, Let's see, Linz, do you are a, I'm one of those. Okay, yeah, I, I, I'm going to assume I can't be wrong. I'm going to stop apologizing. Linz, do you have youth groups in Australia? I mentioned DLA Joby's rainbow. Do you have youth groups? Sorry, I didn't quite catch what you said then. Do we have? Do you have youth groups? DLA Joby's daughter's rainbow. Masonic sponsored youth groups in Australia. Be my life. Uh, youth groups. Uh, no, there, there is there is a, a DMLA, uh, but I'm not sure how um, how common it is. I think mostly the Filipino uh, brethren would be involved in that, but no real Masonic youth groups. Okay. Is that right, Brendan? Brendan? You mentioned you mentioned DMLA? 
Did you? Uh, okay. yeah, no, Lindsay, Lindsay's right. It's, it's primarily the Filipinos that got that up and running. Um, it is a big deal. Again, Virginia has all three youth groups. Um, I grew up, youth groups are important to me because I joined DMLA at 16. And as I saw it, uh, DMLA was basically watered down masonry. So I wanted to join the real deal as soon as I could. So when I got stationed in Virginia and Prince, I joined, uh, I joined, uh, I got active in the DMLA chapter. Uh, funny story, I grew up, I really didn't know a lot about the military life. I, I watched Gomer Pyle a few times. So I was literally under the impression that joining the Marines, I would be stationed in Camp Lejeune and I would be living in a Quonset hut and I would have to get a weekend pass and I wouldn't always get one. So I would never leave the base, right? So I thought, well, I joined at 18 and several members of my DMLA chapter and advisors were Marines. So that drove me to join the Marine Corps. I thought, well, when I'm 22, I'll get out after my first tour and I'll go join a lot then. And I got to Virginia and I checked in at my command and it's a it was a higher headquarters. And I was, so I was working in an office and I went to work the first day and they said, well, be here at 0720. You're off at 1600 every day. And I said, and then one. Well, you have field days on Thursday, so you have to muster for field day, but you're living in the barracks and all. And I was like, well, can I like go out town? And they're like, yeah, what do you think? There's go with pile? What? Yeah, you just, there's no Liberty Pass or anything then. So, no joke. I really thought I would be living away from society for four years. So, I'm 18. I'm in Virginia. I walk to the nearest uh, civilized part of Norfolk, Ward's Corner. I found the Masonic Lodge. I found a DMLA chapter and got active as a member. I was already a member in, in Seattle, so I just started attending. There's no, you didn't have to transfer. You're a DMLA, you're a life member. You can go to any chapter you want. So I got active in the DMLA. And my roommate was 19. I got him to join DMLA at 19. And the age is 13 through 21. But he joined at 19 because he had a car. And it was very easy to bring him in because I said, two girls groups, one boys group. I'm in. So we traveled everywhere. And so from like 19 to yeah, 18, 19, 20, before I left for Okinawa, um, I went everywhere in Virginia and got to know people all over the place. Now, fast forward 30 some years, my son joins uh, Demolay a couple of years ago and we go up to Northern Virginia. Oh, actually, D.C. It was House of the Temple. We went to um, the. Yeah, they had a big uh, weekend where they initiated new members, and I knew everybody in the room. And my son finally asked me, "He's like, how do you know all these people?" It's like because I met them all when I was eighteen, and their sons are in DMLA now, so I know people all over the state. So the youth groups have always been important to me. Uh, Rainbow has gotten much bigger in Virginia since I moved here. There was only like one or two assemblies, but they they got their own state organization. They used to be under South Carolina. But Joby's and Rainbow and DMLA were always big in this state. They've kind of gone down over the years, but they're still active where they are. And uh, that's why I always support the youth groups, because that's what got me into masonry. And it's always been a cool thing. Um, we so, covered a so you married a job's daughter, did you? I had planned to. My wife, her sister was at Joby's. She was too old by the time she joined. And we were both advisors in the youth groups. And that's how we met. So I was very close to my my original rule was I'm going to marry a rainbow or a joke. Um, um, let's see. Go ahead. Yeah, you, right. <laughs> okay. Um, Richard, do you, um, well, I think we covered this a little bit, but do you have research lodges? Sorry, I missed that bet. Do, do you have research lodges? I think Brent, Brendan mentioned it. Oh, well, in South Australia, we don't anymore, but um, or the Northern Territory, but most Australian states would have at least one research lodge. Okay. And Brendan, you mentioned you're in a research lodge. You only meet like four times a year? Or uh, no, we meet about eight or nine times a year. 
Oh, cool. In the, in the upstairs room of our pub, we have a right. planned schedule for the year. Um, so you know at the start of the year what those eight or nine events will be and who's speaking. And then we publish it all at the end of the year in a uh, little glossy book. Very cool. I don't have one to hand. Oh, yes, I do. And, there you go. Okay. And, yeah, we, we used to do proceedings and we stopped. <laughs> um, I've kind of replaced that with our weekly email listing. We haven't published any proceedings in years. So, Brendan, do you, are you, do you, aff- you have to affiliate with a research lodge? You're not allowed to do, you don't make basics. Right. You, no, you we to... don't make. You, you've got to be a master mason to join us, and a member of a lodge in Victoria. Right. Okay. Yeah, we're very similar. Virginia Research Course. We only meet four times a year. Typical in the states, we only meet four times a year. Always on a Saturday, it seems. And you do have to maintain a membership in a new lodge, either in Virginia or a state that we recognize. So, if you're in a Grand Lodge, we recognize you can affiliate with us. Um. Graham, do you have um, special, oh, let's see, what's the right term? Do you have special interest lodges in Australia? Uh, I believe we do. Uh, I think there's a, um, a scout lodge. Um, the, that's, uh, no, I think that's the only one that comes to mind there may be others but that's the only one i'm yeah. aware of and they're a regular lodge they, they make basins and all like that they do they meet like they okay because yeah. i've heard there, about there know, are some uh, there are some military ahead. sort of lodges as well you right. know, people that have been in the military but uh, right. they they're not restri- they're not restricted like they would have been in the past ah and they oh, yeah. they work ordinary they work ordinary degrees they don't have right. traveling warrants okay uh, yeah, we have well, a motor, motorcycle lodge, um, and we also have a couple of ethnic lodges. Greek one, Italian, as I said, there's three Jewish lodges. Right. So we've got <laughs> some that... Um, and in Graham's district, they've got a couple of really big Lebanese lodges. Okay. Uh, thanks. All right. Well, now, I know that England has special interest lodges, and from what I gather... They don't meet, you know, they meet four or six times a year. And people belong to more than one, I guess. But that's something in America that never caught on. I would love to see that in Virginia, that we maybe do a uh, special interest lodge. Uh, I remember one brother I talked to talked about he wanted to start Tobacco Leaf Lodge number 1687 or something. And the number was the year that tobacco was first produced in Virginia. And have it. Uh, the idea was... We would actually be able to smoke cigarettes or cigars or pipes in the lodge meeting, but he never he never brought that to fruition. But that was his goal: to have a, a tobacco leaf lodge. <laughs> uh, but years ago, go ahead. Oh, years ago they used to have things like taxi drivers' lodges and uh, right. football players' lodges and a lodge for people that worked in the tax office and that kind right. of thing. Um, all of those have fallen away. Yeah. just Is that just because membership has dropped, that there's not enough interest there's, to keep it going? It makes sense. Yeah, there's not enough taxi drivers or tax office employees or that okay. sort of thing. Uh, Brendan, do you, what is the primary charity? Does your Grand Lodge have a particular charity that they endorse? Uh, no, it varies. For a while, it was a breast cancer centre we were supporting. I'm not sure what their current one is. And quite often, most lodges have their own charity that right. they raise right. funds for. Right. Well, I, was, I was thinking more like at a, as a, at a grand lodge level like Virginia. Well, they like to say that the Masonic Home is our charity, but that's a very selfish charity because it's only open to Virginia Masons and their wives and widows. But that's our charity. But we do have yeah, like, blood drives. Uh, the American Red Cross. Yeah, a of, you do. Go ahead. A lot of the country lodges will support okay. some community thing in their region or okay. whatever. Right. Okay. Um, Linz, do you take up money at every meeting? Um, yeah. Do you, other than dues, do you like? Do you rate? Do you collect? I don't know. Do you have a, a Masonic home, or do you have any sort of a, a regular charity that your lodge passes the hat for at your meetings? 
Well, we, we do have um, Masonic homes in Victoria. Um, okay. Uh, we would only um, collect money in the in the south. Perhaps maybe we have a raffle generally every ah. uh, every uh, every meeting, and uh, occasionally the um, the proceeds of the raffle will be donated to a specific um, organisation or, or person who's in in particular need at that time. But there's no regular collection okay. of money for a particular group. Right. Like I mentioned, we have the Masonic Home, and we have a uh, what is it the uh, what is the name? Well, anyway, you get a nice award. You're you're uh, encouraged by the Grand Lodge to raise money for the Masonic Home, and we typically do it like at the annual. We pass the hat for that, but you know they have money taken out of our dues every year at the Grand Lodge level, specifically for the home. Well, that doesn't stop them from you know passing the hat. But the Masonic Home of Virginia is actually a really nice, well established one, and they've put a lot of work into it. It has a very large endowment that they build up. Uh, I think they set out to make a $10 million endowment fund and they reached that within a couple months. So they said, ah, screw it, 20 million. We're going for 20 million. So they managed to raise, and I think at least 20 million for their endowment, which is nice, but we definitely get our arms to us to do, donate to the home. But they give little plaques and stuff. If your lodge donates, you know, $500 one year, you get a nice little plaque or something from the side home. Um, in, um can I just oh, add, go in New go South ahead, Wales we have in New South Wales we have two charities, uh the Masonic mm. Homes, yep. and of course the that's the Witten Homes, um, and we have a youth charity <coughs> which is a start uh, what we call now it's now known as a start in life, and that's uh, predominantly for educational purposes for um, Masonic uh, children. Um, to get uh, education paid for and the likes of that. And in uh, Western Australia, the Scottish uh, Constitution have the the Scottish uh, Masonic uh, Charities Foundation. Okay. Um, Richard, do you have, do you wear Masonic rings or lapel pins? And oh, some people wear rings, but not most people probably don't. But uh, people do tend to we, – we tend to go more for the pins, I think, rather than the rings. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I've, I've got a friend who's probably got about 20 pins on his lapel. Yes. Uh, I, I always have fun picking out what lapel pins are going to the time. But I don't generally wear them in public, but I wear my rings on certain beats. Um, uh, Graham, do you have car emblems or other more public displays, bumper stickers, anything like that? That you're a Mason. Uh, cards? Do you say you cards? You what? Stickers. Sorry, oh, I, sorry. Missed, I missed that question. Like, like, like we have the the magnetic pins or the stick, you know, the big emblems you put on the back of your vehicle. Is that uh, a thing in Australia? It's, I, I, to my knowledge, it's not all that big. Like, we don't sort of go out of our way to advertise that we are Masons. Uh, yeah, we, we do. We do do it, but as like it's more of an individual type, of like right. Or if we do yeah. it as, as an event. Okay. Yeah, Virginia. There, there, there are several places you can get um, the Sonic emblems, and a lot of people have them in their cars. I had a bunch of magnetic stickers made of when I was master motion viewer. I found a great place online that has like these round magnetic stickers or like oval shaped, like this big. If you see. It's designed, I don't know if you all have that out there, but like here we have like the Outer Banks and you have, um, well, in Europe, you know, you have the round ovals for each country it was quite a thing before the EU where you have like GB for Great Britain and what all. And we kind of copied that idea here in the state, like OBX for the Outer Banks, a whole bunch of, you know, non-country uh, or state-related things, but the oval magnetic stickers became a big thing in Virginia. So I had the Ocean View logo put on stickers with our, our lodge website on it. I gave those out my year to all the members. And so we have quite a few people like to announce themselves on their cars. We have quite a few of them song stuff. But like Italy, oh my God, what I visited, like I mentioned Harry Truman Lodge, which was a military lodge, so all Americans. We had a chance to go visit a lodge in Naples that was strictly Grand Orient of Italy, 
It was actual Italian basis. And the whole meeting was in Italian. I couldn't understand half of what they were saying, but it was fun to attend. One of the brothers came up to meet me, and it was like the Prince Hall guy. He looked at my lapel, and he's like, and he pointed my, I had my lodge name plate, you know, on my pocket, and I had several Masonic emblems on my lapels. He was surprised because, of course, in Italy, you had this issue with propaganda due in like the 70s and the the, the, the Vatican Bank and a certain London banker who got hanged from a bridge and a whole bunch of other stuff went on involving the Italians. Uh, but uh, the Italians generally don't advertise their Masonic membership because P2 kind of ruined it for everybody in, in, uh, in Italy. And the government took a tim, dim view and lodges had to turn over their membership rosters to the state because they were worried there were so many cops and judges and lawyers and all who were Masons, and they're doing very bad things on their own. So they don't wear rings. They don't wear lapel pins. They don't have car emblems. They do not advertise their Masonic membership. What's, what's, but it's, fairly, it's fairly low-key across Europe, because remember, mm -hmm. 70 years ago, they got wiped out. Well, this is true. Most, too. most of them got shipped off to prison war camps yes. and their lodge buildings got destroyed. So they don't kind of advertise they, they much anymore. Keep it, they want to keep it on the down low, understand. Yeah. Um, Richard, are your buildings clearly marked? Like, do you have a square and compass outside as well? Yep, you're muted. Sorry. Our buildings are clearly marked in South Australia. Okay. Uh, They'll, they'll have, say, the square and compass, but they'll also have a big sign up saying the Freemasons. Right. And okay. there's, a, there's a standard sign for that. All right. And, uh, but, the, but the trouble is that some of the signs have been put up on buildings that are, you know, 110 years old, and it oh. doesn't really fit the architectural style of the ah. past. Right. Understood. Uh, Graham, are there any prominent leaders? in your lodges like i don't know government officials celebrities you know people that are well known in the community or is it mostly just working class um, again i'm not too sure currently but uh, in the past we've had the uh, lord carrington he was the first grand master of united grand lodge all new south wales and act uh he was a, I think he was a Cambridge scholar. And so uh, he's one that comes to mind uh, in New South Wales. Um, of course, I know of other Australians that are uh, famous Australians, like politicians in the past and, and the like. And, of course, uh, the current, I know in Victoria, for example, the current uh, Lord Gilwell, uh, is a member of the Scouting Lodge in uh, Victoria. Okay. We, we, we don't have as much. I mean, it seems like all of our famous Masons in America are all in the past. We've had 14 presidents who were Masons, and none recently. Gerald Ford was the last. But we don't have a lot of public people who are active in the Lodge who are no. I think most people who are in public life kind of kind of downplay their if they are Masons, they don't make as much of a deal of it as we used to. Um, Brendan, um, are you allowed to affiliate within your Grand Lodge? Can you belong to as many lodges as you like? Uh, I'm a member of, I think, five. <laughs> okay. And, and each uh, one is completely different. Completely different. One of, them being, one of them being a virtual lodge. Oh, interesting. All right, and Liz, are are you allowed to affiliate with lodges and other grand lodges? Obviously, you are. I think you all have mentioned that, but there's no limitation on belonging to a grand more than one grand lodge in Australia. That's a good question. I'm not sure about that. I don't think there is. I think you can be a member of um, okay in jurisdictions, but there are obviously there are some uh, some aren't recognised. Uh, you know, you, well, you have your, your well, them claim over there. But uh, yeah, you can you can only be a member of um, lodges that are in amity with the with the grand well, lodge. Of course. Uh, All right. Well, like 
Virginia, by comparison, you can log to as many log nodes as you want in Virginia. You can affiliate with as many as you like. And of course, our research lodges allows you, you know, belong. Uh, you have to affiliate. We don't have a restriction, like if you belong to a lodge in Michigan or something, you can affiliate in a Virginia lodge and we don't buy. There are certain other grant lodges in America where you are not allowed to affiliate with more than one lodge, period, or a lodge in another jurisdiction. So, like, we have brothers who come here from, say, Michigan who move here. I, I don't know specifically which one. I'll, I'll, I'll assume Michigan meets this. Uh, a brother from Michigan belongs to a lodge, lives in Virginia, joins a Virginia lodge. He has to then demit from his lodge in Michigan because they don't allow him to belong to more than one. So just because we allow it, other grand lodges don't, and you have to decide what you're going to do. Um, about affiliation, I think we have it. I think we do it the right way in Virginia. Let's say I belong to a lodge here. Like I, I belong to Charles T. Morton. I affiliated with Ocean View. On my form for affiliation, I put, you know, am I demitting from my other lodge or am I going to keep membership in both? And they get to vote on me. And once they bring me in, they would then send a demit. The secretary would send a demit back to my mother lodge and say he's no longer a member. Some states, some jurisdictions, you have to, if you want to apply to another lodge, you have to demit from your lodge, then put in your petition. And then if you're voted in, you're now a Mason again. If not, if they turn you down, you're no longer a member of any lodge unless you go crawling back, I guess, to your mother lodge and say, it was a mistake, I want to come back. But you can literally get yourself out of a lodge because you can't affiliate with another lodge unless you've already left the one you're in, which to me is, I think, incredibly unfair. It's like, if you say, I can only belong to one at a time, the fair thing is, well, if you petition and they let you in, then you're no longer a member of the first one. But to make you actually demit first, I think it's a credible burden on you. That's what's called dual and pl or plural membership. Absolutely. Uh, Pennsylvania allows you to be a member of another lodge outside Pennsylvania, but you can be only be a member of one inside in Pennsylvania. In Pennsylvania. And, wow. That's, well, I guess that's fair. That's how they want to do things. Okay. The last question, this is for every one of you. I'll go around. Um, I'll start with Graham. What is the biggest difference in your mind between American lodges and Australian lodges? Or masonry in general, between the two? Well, masonry in, def in general, uh, I find it great to be able to associate and affiliate, even with these Zoom meetings. And I've been on a number of them getting a viewpoint that's different to what we how we run things here in uh, here in Australia or in New South Wales in particular. And that's great. You know, travelling between states, seeing different how, how the workings in say Queensland is to the workings in Tasmania or Victoria right. or yeah. you know, it's uh, about learning and um seeing how they participate. Some will allow, some lodges will, will allow you to have the ritual book open um, for, de for degree work. Others frown on it, you know? Right. Okay. Just uh, Brendan, same question. What's the one, what's the one biggest difference you think between American and Australian? Basically. Oh. Boy, that's a tricky question, actually, because we, we do have a lot of differences. Um, Maybe something I haven't covered is what I'm looking for. Well, I, I, was, I was kind of thinking probably the biggest difference is that most, but not all states, do their open in the third degree. And okay. I probably think that's the biggest difference because we always open in the first, and if we need to go up, we go up. Yeah. Whereas All you right. guys, uh, it's the reverse. You open in the third, yes. and if you need to go down, only, you go down. If, if we don't, if we don't work in the EA this year, we're not going to open at the EA lodge. That's true. Yeah. All right, Liz. Yes. All right, yeah, I did, Liz. I'm sorry, uh, Richard. Same question. What's the biggest difference between um, American and Australian masonry? If we haven't, some of we haven't covered yet, you can think of anything. Well, you've got the 
you know, you've got the idea of the York right, which we uh -huh. don't have. Yeah. Uh, also, I think you've got the virtual past master degree, whereas ours is, you know, that's part of the craft and uh, it's part of the Royal Arts or anything like that. And uh, you could never become a master without going through the degree of installed master. So, right. Well, again, we, we, we have it. It's a requirement. But for us, like I said, you get it when you're before you're elected junior warden. So you do have to have it. But it's earlier along the way. For you all, it's the night you're installed, whereas we do it a couple of years before. OK, I, want, I, I really appreciate all of my great panel. You have some excellent answers. This is great. I'm sorry, some of you put stuff in the chat, and I would have rather you say it openly so everybody can hear it, because the chat doesn't go to YouTube. Oh, if you're watching this on YouTube, please like it, subscribe. We appreciate it. I got to mention that this once, because this will be on YouTube here. Uh, Whenever I get off my ass and put it on YouTube, probably in a couple of weeks. I think I'm about three behind now, so I need to get going on that. Do any of our other guests today, any of our other members, want to ask a question? Then something I didn't cover. Any comments on Australian basic pain? It's here's your chance. Um, you're commenting about what, how you open open your degrees, uh, your lodge, your meetings. Um, outside of the United States and parts of Canada, almost everybody works in the first degree unless they're conferring a degree. Um, right. And uh, in, in, in the District of Columbia, Grand Lodge, a number of years ago, they made a rule that the master could open his lodge, or stated, on any of the three degrees he wanted or needed to, if he oh. had EAs or fellow crafts, well, right. he went on them so they could attend. Interesting. But could they vote? No. Okay. But they can attend. Well, you're Master Mason. Right. I think there's value in that. But I, I guess the idea that we want to encourage them to hurry up and get to the Master Mason's degree is probably why we're doing it the way we do. My feeling is that um, if you can't attend Lodge until you're a Master Mason, then that ins it's the incentive for the Lodge to right. pass them and raise them. While yes. uh, if you could have started attending Lodge right away, then the Lodge says, oh, well, heck with it. We can take our dang time about passing and raising them. So, exactly. <laughs> I don't know, but you, got, do you don't want to allow Oh, but the other side of that coin is that you can use their attendance as a guide to their eagerness. Right. So if you're always open yeah. in the first degree, how often is that entrepreneur going to turn up? If they don't turn up, well, you kind of go, well, you're not that interested. Exactly. You're not turning up. I, I, I like to think I, you should be showing the lodge that you're – you're interested that you want to be there. Now, I will say this, going back to the Italian Lodge that I mentioned, I, I wish I could remember the name of it. I don't know if I have it written down anywhere. This is, this is before email and all of that. There are times when I wish that we had email and the internet years and years and years ago when I was traveling overseas because it would have made life a lot easier. Um, they met in the Edit Apprentice degree for all their meetings. You can be an editor apprentice for several years, years before you get the fellow craft or the master mason. And you can actually serve as master of your lodge. You can be an EA and in theory be master of your lodge, but not be a master mason again. And that to me is like, but what's, I would think at a minimum, if you're going to be an officer, you got to be a master mason. Like we have the uh, catechisms I mentioned. We have a master mason's catechism in Virginia. There is nothing requiring in a master mason to bother, and I'll say bother, learning his master's catechism. But I tell them, look, you just spent three months, six months learning this. Master masons isn't much harder than the fellow craft. You've already got through two. You might as well continue while you're on this pace of constantly working to get your master masons out of the way because it's going to come easier to you now than put it off. You get a nice little certificate from the Grand Lodge, but that's it. Now, my lodge, if you haven't got your Master Mason's Catechism, we're not going to make you an office. And honestly, if you're going to learn the degree work, 
you might as well knock out the Master Mason's Catechism because that's half the degree work right there. So it's I guess each lodge has their own way of uh, encouraging the new Mason to learn his Master's Catechism. But literally, and I don't know, I, I'm thinking if you're going to be master of your lodge and you go to the trouble of learning the warden certificate, you've done everything in the Master's Catechism. You have no excuse not to go ahead and knock out that catechism before your master. But that's in my take. Uh, other questions? Anyone? Or any other comments? This what has been really great. Be I love biggest, this. Go ahead, What would Brandon. be the biggest difference between American Mason and Masonry and Australian Masonry for your brief look at it this morning? What do you think it would be? Oh, me? Yeah. Um, I have so many things. I don't know. I was focused on the questions. Uh, Oh, wow. I think um, I'd have to go back and relook at it, but there are not a huge number of differences, not like I've seen elsewhere. Um, honestly, I think you're not that different from England as far as the, I think of like appended bodies and things like that, because in my mind, being a Mason, you're only in the Blue Lodge by itself for a time, and you owe it to yourself to join the other bodies. So I think kind of the way you structure your appended bodies seems like quite a bit of difference but if you're a purist and say only the blue lodge i guess it's the idea of you meet on the first degree um i don't know i'll still focus on the questions that do retain all the answers i don't have to watch the film again to give a good answer myself um but in a lot of ways you're very similar i have to say um the dress is similar number of officers um I guess one big thing that I think is different is you only elect certain people. You don't elect your grandmaster. That's a huge difference from us. I like the oh, idea good. of electing the grand officers. I think the progress, I have problems with the progressive line, but it's so entrenched. I don't see that going away. Uh, but you have a progressive line too, but you literally don't get elected master. That's it. You only get elected master. You get appointed. So, but again, it, 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 as a on the ground, real world, um, Brendan, it's like the master nominates his junior deacon. There was a time back in the eighties when I joined that you were required to have two nominees for grand junior deacon at Grand Lodge, and you were required to have two nominees at each lodge for junior deacon. You had to nominate someone, and it was a joke. I remember running. For junior deacon and i'd been active in my lodge and i was a steward and i did everything and they nominated some other guy opposed to me i'm like what are you this is a slap in the face to me you know it's like i put in the work i didn't realize it was required thankfully they got rid of that but pretty much as far as a real world what happens for for real is the master picks his junior deacon and that's it it's up to the master to pick his officers we have the progressive line. He only has to fill the junior deacon spot. And there is almost never a challenge from the floor. Because in, in most blue lodges, you're fighting to find a junior deacon. You're looking at your recent... We just initiated Paul and Linz this year. So Paul showed up for more meetings. We're going to stick him as junior deacon, whether he likes it or not. And that's the reality is you join a lodge here and you're going to be junior deacon within a year because we're... We only do a one year in office. You got five elected offices, not counting the secretary treasurer because they're multi year. And so many lodges. And I think uh, Ocean View falls under the, or um, Norton, uh, Charles D. Morton fell under this problem. You bring in your newly raised guy and he's going to be junior deacon within six months or a year. Not, well, not even six months. I was raised in well, October and I was elected junior deacon in December. It all depends on when you join. I say less than 12, we'll say. And I think, honestly, if a lodge, if a lodge is at the point where every, their biggest concern is who's going to be junior deacon next year, you don't have time to do Masonic education or officer training or anything. You're only focused on getting an eye. And the progressive line only is useful in a big lodge where you have three or four candidates who would be a good junior deacon and you fight for it. I mean, you literally, okay, well, Paul's been at every meeting, but Linz has already memorized several ritual parts. You know, who do we pick to be junior? You make it where 
it should be a competition. I think you should be earning the right to be junior deacon and lead your lodge. And a big lodge has the the luxury, if you will, of finding the best candidate. A small lodge, because you have to roll through all the chairs every year, you got to find five guys every year who are willing to be officers. And I think that's what's really hurting us is this progressive line idea. But I well, mean, this has been all very good. I enjoyed all of it, but I'm going to have to tell you all, uh, wish you all a good night and our, our Australian brothers a good morning. And Thank uh, you. I'll hope to see you some other time. Bye now. Thank you. Thanks, I Robert. appreciate you attending. Bye, Robert. Yes. So I think I don't. I think it, it's. I think go it's, ahead. it's interesting you say that, but uh, from where we sit, we sort of look at the masters. When he goes in, he selects his team. Apart from what Richard was saying, uh, the three three officers that are elected, right? Uh, because because it's he's he wants his people around him, the people he can trust to perform, to turn up, to do the ritual correctly, to do uh, to do all that at, from time to time. That's why we appoint, and or the master appoints, rather than you guys uh, elect all of your officers. And just you to be get, clear, it's, 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 it is implied it's progressive, but your new master could pick four brand new guys off the sword. Yep. Or he could say, "I'm gonna, I'm gonna take the junior warden and keep him where he is till he's good, and maybe yeah. move him down to junior deacon." Or you can pretty much shuffle the whole board every election uh, every year. And of course, the the secretary is for life. Well, yes, <laughs> yeah. What's your secretary? You're... Now, what's funny is typically, I, I, I guess I should ask this earlier. Like, well, but you you said the Tyler was elected. Right? It's because he's paid. Is he's typically a past master? Uh, he doesn't be. even have to be a member of the lodge. Oh, okay. Um, he, he should well, be, yes, but he doesn't have to be. He can be a master mason. It is, I'll say in Virginia, it is quite rare to have a Tyler who is not a past master. But we do have, um, Pete will remember, um, John LeClaire. Our career Tyler, you remember him? Yeah. John LeClaire was a member of, I think, Ruth or Atlantic, one of the lodges at the Big Temple in Granby. He was Tyler of at least four lodges. Uh, right. And um, um, Roy T. Gregory, who was our Scottish Rite Tyler, he's the same boat. He's never been master of a lodge, and he's been Tyler for a number of lodges, and he's Tyler for the Royal Arch. He's Tyler for the Scottish Rite. He likes being Tyler, I guess. But typically, yeah, we, we have some of those. That you have Tyler's career Tyler's? 20 um, lodges or something. Typically, you turn up and go, what? You're here as well? Yeah. Typically, you go out, like in Ocean View, you go out as Master and you're Tyler for a year. I told him no. I said, pick someone else. And that kind of upset them. But it's like, I'm not interested in being Tyler. But that's just me. I'd rather be in the meeting. I'm there to be in the meeting. But now, typically, now, you rotate yeah. out as master, and you're Tyler for a year. So our immediate past master, his job is Tyler. But that's Ocean okay. View. Yeah. Now, I, is your Tyler required to stay outside? Well, we open the meeting, and he yeah, gets to watch everything but yeah. the degree work or the ballot. Yes. Yeah, because we open once we open up. We open up the door and the Tyler sits in the door so he can hear everything going Correct. on. Correct. Yes. We do the same. Most lodges do that, except yeah. when you ballot and except when you have degree work or like the catechism. Anything is ritual, he, he has to shut the door. But yes, we, we no, try to. Once the, the door Tyler. is closed, it's closed. Yeah. Now they say that's something I could have asked. So yeah, you do not invite in the Tyler. We have actually a specific ritual that says to allow the Tyler to tile from without and watch yeah. the meeting. It, yeah, uh, you can Tyler, close the outer door, open up the inner door, and tile from without. Right. Uh, now, you can invite him in if you've got a guest speaker or something, but for the rest of the time, the Tyler is outside because he's a paid employee. Exactly. And yep. most Tylers aren't a member of your lodge. Oh, I wanted to say hello to Dennis D., who joined while we after we started. Good to have you with us, brother. 
Yeah, hi. Um, I'm actually a Northern Virginia Cherrydale member, and I'm enjoying this conversation because um, I'm maybe going to be joining a lodge in Germany, so I um, wanted to get insight on a lodge outside the U.S. Outstanding, um, outstanding. But what I found fascinating is that you guys have a lot of, um, you know, it isn't as open as here in the U.S. So people wear paraphernalia for masonry on cars and rings and shirts and everywhere. And when you go to like Europe or um, it sounds like it, over there as well, that um, it's just more low key. So well, I having said that, a couple of weeks ago, a, a friend and I were walking through a car park and a guy was getting in his car and he had the compass and set square on the back of it. So we stopped and chatted. He got excluded from his lodge years ago and we chatted to him and he's rejoined his lodge. Oh, outstanding. Way to go, Brendan, bringing it back in the fold. That's great. Uh, well, he, he obviously must have been thinking about it because he's got this great big spare and square and compass on the back of his car. Now, this is now this is just my observation. Now, early on in my career, I did a lot of time. I waited tables and all that. I, I found I would go up to people when I was waiting tables. If I see someone with a ring, I go up and say hello. Virtually every Mason I ever met in public who's wearing a square and compass has not been to his lodge in at least five years. But they wear the ring everywhere, and they wear it in public. I almost never wear my rings out in public, unless it's a formal occasion, like a dinner. I'll make sure I put them up. And I don't wear them every day. I, I type, you know, I'm a developer, so I'm, I'm on my computer all day. The rings are heavy when you type, so I don't wear them. I only wear them to go to the lodge or something else. But the men I meet who wear a ring all the time they want to be a member of the lodge. They want to say they're a mason. They want to wear that ring, and they never go. And that's just so funny. To me. And I'm like, well, why don't you? you know, do you have, why don't you go to lodge? Oh, well, you know. So it's like they want to have the ring. They want to say they're a mason, but they're not active in the lodge. And you have to allow for a certain percentage of our membership who pay the dues and wear their rings. And you know, they know they're a mason, but. I don't know. I'd love it if every Mason was active. We had that question here a couple months ago, I think. I asked the question to the group. I still got to put that out on YouTube by itself because um, that was a really good discussion. It's like, would you rather belong to a lodge that had 30 Masons and all Masons attended every meeting or a lodge that had 200 Masons and only 20 attended? And everybody here in the chat said, I would rather be a small lodge where everyone was active. And that's very interesting. But most lodge takes most lodges take the I guess the pragmatic view is, well, I got 180 guys who pay dues who never show up and they're paying for the 20 who do to enjoy it. So it's a it's necessary. But I think a lodge would get more done if they had 20, 30 members who were there at every meeting. And maybe you charge more in dues, but everybody there is willing to pay it. It's the guy who never shows up. Who says I can't pay one hundred fifty dollars a year? That's too much. Guys are willing to quit over ten bucks a month a year. So, anyone else have any questions or any more comments? We just hit ten o'clock on the East Coast. It's uh, let's see. It's uh, it's um. Let me see if I can do the math here. It's either ten or eleven or noon in Australia. Am I correct? Uh, it's 12 o'clock here, noon in Victoria and New South Wales, and 11.30 in South Australia with Richard. Okay. <laughs> we, have a half, we have a half-hour time zone. Right. We're we one of them. <laughs> <laughs> so we get to have a drink a bit earlier. That's true. Well, I applaud Graham because Graham shows up for regularly at our meetings and it's 1 a.m., and I admire his tenacity of leaving the pub at quarter to one and getting home to get on his computer and attend our meetings. But he's he's been a regular. I, do that, but... <laughs> I really appreciate all of you on my panel. This was really good. You all did an excellent job defending the faith here and uh, telling us about Australia. Uh, Brendan and I talked a bit when he had his talk here a couple months a month so ago about the his early history of Victoria. And that's what inspired me to make my next panel about Australia because I got about 20 of you all on my mailing list and uh, I got four of you to show up. So that's pretty good. I'm happy with that. I, I wanted enough to have a good panel. 
and y'all did an excellent job. So this was a lot of fun. I want to do more of these panels because it, it's fun to give us a view into what it's like. And if you're watching, by the way, if you're watching on YouTube, like and subscribe. But all of you watching here or if you're watching us on YouTube, we have, I think this is the fourth or fifth panel discussion I've had with other Masons in other countries. And I'm going to keep having them. Um, I think uh, it's a lot of fun kind of exploring the differences and, and the similarities. I'm surprised that you all are very similar. Pretty much what you do is identical to what we do or what they do in England. I think pretty much covers what you all are doing there. So some other grand jurisdictions have been way different. Brazil was way different in how they approach things. But you guys are not that dissimilar from us, I would say. There are differences, but they're not major. Most no, of us have got, got rid of a lot of the stuff you have in the you know various degrees, like beehives and uh, other emblems we don't have anymore. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Well, like you have that wonderful charge on the five senses. We don't have that. Oh, really? Oh. Well, it's pretty so, much in the lectures. I mean, to be honest, if, if you take the average Mason who doesn't go to degrees a lot, you could show him all the emblems of Masonry, and he probably couldn't tell you what degree they belong to. But unless you're going to lodge and hearing the lecture, you honestly don't get to hear about the beehive or the five steps or the pot of incense or and all of that. The, the dagger pointing to the heart. Uh, yeah, all of that stuff. It's in the degrees. It's in the lectures, but it's cool. not anywhere else. And in the research lodge, I will say this to give props to those of us who give research papers. We write papers about the beehive and other things and explore what they mean and all like that. Because a lot of times, if, if, if you don't bother to hear the lectures, you don't know about the symbolism. We're not talking about it. We're talking about the working tools. And you know what the working tools are in each degree, but you don't know all these other emblems that are only in the lectures. Because they don't get brought up to regular meaning. I had to join Athelstan to get all those other bits. Yeah. The the order of Athelstan covers all of those bits that are that we've left out. Excellent. All right. Well, brothers, right. it's just after Thank 10. You, Christopher. Thank you all very much. Anybody have any parting words before we close out? I, I will I, I would I want to Yeah, I just said it in the chat. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed this session. It's very informative. I really enjoy the diversity of the, 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 the conversation and the question and answer format. And uh, yeah, I think it would be a great YouTube to review. So take care. Okay. Thank you, Dennis. Um, oh, I can't minimize Zoom. So let me just, it's yelling at me because I was trying to minimize Zoom. Let me, ah, come on, cooperate. Um, I was going to mention our other man. You've got dark. This is what happens when and, lodges go oh dark. Oh, no. Oh, no. There we are. There he is. Sorry, let me. You can't look. It won't let me. I'm, 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 I'm trying not to minimize. Let me do this. There. Okay. Be Again, it's my laptop. My laptop isn't cooperating. Okay. Rosicrucianism. Yeah. Rosicrucianism and Freemasonry. Mm -hmm. Two weeks from now. Or no. Well, yeah. No, almost a month. Okay. I'm wrong. What am I missing? May 13th. I'm sorry. Well, anyway, May 27th <laughs> will be Rosicrucianism and Freemasonry. Uh, brother, let me read my thing here. That is, I'm not cooperating. Well, here, give me one second about, and it's not showing me my information. Okay, we have Brother Liss, who is going to be our guest speaker. He will be speaking of Rosicrucianism and Freemasonry. And for some reason, it's not letting me read the notes of my, from my meeting. But, uh, oh, here we go. So what are Freemasons and where do they come from? So what are Rosicrucians and where do they come from? Are these two bodies related to their origins and how? Um, Brother Alstair Lees will be giving a, he'll be answering these okay. questions and more, speaking about Rosicrucianism and Freemasonry. So that's on the 20th century. Yes. He's, Eng and, he's an Englishman. And yeah. um, I'm looking forward to that. And on April, sorry, May 13th, and I don't know why, 
but I do not have an event yet for what I did. Um, I thought I, I'm going to Facebook and reading my events coming up, and it's not listed there. So if you give me one second, I will tell you April 13th, or May 13th is our next talk in two weeks. And let me see if I can bring it up another place. Um, yes, a Kabbalist, there it is, uh, brother, brother Rodney Mitgilvery will be speaking on May 13th about a Kabbalistic interpretation of Freemasonry. I think this is the second or third Kabbalah-related talk we've had in our Zoom meeting. So, interesting things coming up in uh, the, ne the coming weeks. Um, yes, so those are our next two coming up after this one. So I hope you all will come back and attend. If you're here for the first time, I appreciate it. And um, we know we meet on Saturday mornings. Uh, we'll, I didn't know if I was going to get more or less attendees being on a Friday, but it seems like we got the same number. So I don't know. I try to be accommodating because not everybody can attend on a Saturday and the time zone differences. But uh, this worked out real well. Uh, I'm glad we had at least uh, 13, 14 people here for our panel. So this is a good turnout. Thank you all once again. Thank you, everybody, for attending. My panelists, I appreciate it. And uh, it's been a lot of fun. And we'll have another panel discussion soon. So I'm going to go and sign off. You brothers have a wonderful day in Australia. Enjoy your Saturday. And We'll enjoy the rest of our evening here on the East Coast. Y'all take care. Thanks, now. Christopher. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Christopher. Bye bye. bye, -bye.